It's May 20th, 1980, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. What do you do if you're near a nuclear bomb explosion? Well, you get blown to bits, most likely, but on the off chance you don't, you'd do well to have read the British government's sort of eerie yet weirdly whimsical pamphlet, Protect and Survive, which was published today in history in 1980, and which includes helpful hints on everything from building a shelter out of books and clothing to what to do with your toilet after the bomb drops. Yeah, and it was published today, as you say, but that actually wasn't the plan for it. This 32-page booklet, which has gone down in infamy, describing how to make shelters out of doors and tables and cover them in bags and boxes of dirt and bring 14 days' worth of water down to your cellar so that you can live in the event of nuclear fallout, (laughs) all of that was only brought to the public attention at all because the Times, the Times of London, the newspaper, had been running a campaign challenging Uh, the Home Office challenging civil servants, saying, how are you prepared in the event of a nuclear attack from the Soviets? And found out about the existence of this pamphlet, which had been drafted in the 70s, but was only ever intended to have been released if we were about to have an imminent nuclear attack. And actually, they hadn't judged that now would be the moment. But the public pressure for people to see it was such that they then published it. Uh, and received a lot of humiliation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it had been compiled as a companion to a series of short public information films that would be shown only if war was considered an imminent possibility. A little bit like the tie-in books you get after a new Nigella series drops, you know. So the titles of the episodes included What to Do When the Warnings Sound, What to Put in Your Fallout Room, and The Importance of Your Radio. As you mentioned, it didn't really make sense to publish the pamphlet separately. About 2,000 copies had been distributed to senior police and local authorities. After the press Pressure from the Times in January 1980, you know, publishing extracts from the Panther, which hadn't been withheld from anyone, so it was easy for them to get their hands on a copy. It generated some general interest in the contents, and the companion public information films were leaked to the BBC two months later. They broadcast clips from them in an episode of Panorama, so this created a bit of media froth around the whole thing. Uh, and the Minister of State for Home Affairs, Leon Britton, addressed the issue in the House of Commons, stressing that the pamphlet was not a secret. He said it has not been published for the simple reason it was produced for distribution at a time of grave international crisis. And of course, no one had way of knowing this at the time, but the threat of nuclear conflict, barring a few false alarms that are based on misunderstandings or accidents, had really peaked with the Cuban Missile Crisis almost 20 years before. So if it hadn't been for all this media attention, probably the pamphlet would never have been published on a wide level. And I think almost the fact that there was no crisis currently happening was the reason why it was so poorly received. Because, you know, if a bomb was about to drop, I think you'd take this thing very seriously. But as it was, it just seemed like sort of crazily out of step with what was going on in the world and what you would possibly need to uh, know to survive in such a situation. It must be said it it was pretty chilling reading and wouldn't have been ideal for anyone with a kind of nervous disposition. On its first page, it said, read this booklet with care. Your life and the lives of your family may depend upon it. And then as you got into it, it had this sort of very earnest advice for people to brick up their windows and remove handles from toilet cisterns in the event of a bomb dropping and, you know, ran like this for 30 pages uh, with, you know, all sorts of things about how to handle your dead loved ones if their rotting corpses are still in the, like, the next room and and all of this kind of stuff that seemed very almost alarmist and yet way too impractical. I think that's the other thing, that people felt like they understood the fact better than this pamphlet seemed to be asserting, that the danger of a nuclear strike was so visceral that it's very unlikely that anyone would be around to need any of this, because you you wouldn't need to mop up the dead, because you would genuinely be among them. And and the very stark graphic style as well, sort of Mm. the banality of, and this is how you prepare for nuclear fallout, has become a classic, hasn't it? It's actually, it was the um, cover art for Karma Police by Radiohead was one of the uh, illustrations from this booklet. Because they seem ridiculous and the terror of it is the fact that you have these sort of faceless, average-looking people going about what appears to be a calm process when actually all around them people are being burned alive. But the tone, I would say, is similar to, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's when you get on a plane and you get the um, safety booklet you know, in the seat in front of you. Yeah. They can they can make a fun safety video, can't they, with Rowan Atkinson in it. But ultimately, 
you need to look at the card and anyone, children, people who don't speak the same language as the airline, need to understand what they would do when the plane crashes into the ocean. And at that point, humour goes out the window. Irony goes out the window. Nuance goes out the window. It's like, this is a picture of a woman removing her high heels. This is a picture of a man blowing a whistle because that's what you need to do. And that's what this was designed for. The moment that your eight-year-old son or daughter has to understand how to continue to live when all around them have died. Yeah, the main thrust of the advice is stay in your home. Those unlucky enough to be outside their home when the missile arrives get the rather, I think, optimistic advice to lie flat in a ditch and cover their head and hands. If there is no building nearby, lie flat in a ditch. I'm like, how many ditches are there? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yes, and sort of as we've touched on, this kind of idea that you might be able to get by in the event of a nuclear blast by doing this was looked upon very dimly by organisations like the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, they opposed the publication on precisely that logic, you know, promoting the idea that you could be okay in the event of nuclear war if you just followed the advice was false and that false confidence made war more likely. Protect and Survive had been developed specifically in response to the poor reception of a pamphlet from 1963 called Advising the Householder on Protection Against Nuclear Attack. And this obviously was the time, you know, it was Cuban Missile Crisis time. This was when it really was most likely. And that pamphlet itself had its roots in a World War II handout that was about air raids. You know, it had been updated in the 50s in light of the development of hydrogen bombs and then updated again for nuclear warfare. And it turns out, you know, the prospect of annihilation warranted a bit more than a a rewrite of something that was about Anderson shelters. And householders expressed dissatisfaction with its vagueness and lack of explanation for the advice. And the truth was the vagueness was because governments weren't exactly sure themselves. You know, the scientific research on protection from radiation was far from conclusive. And by 1980, when Protect and Survive came out, you know, the science had advanced, but it was really advancing in the direction of yikes like there's not really much we can tell you so just stay at home and don't make a fuss until you dissolve i guess my favorite quote from the 1963 pamphlet on how to survive a nuclear attack if you have to go outside put on gum boots or stout shoes a hat or a headscarf <laughs> coat done up to the neck and gloves <laughs> <laughs> act like it's, like it's windy just, yeah, it's a bit blowy <laughs> nuclear <out>. winter <laughs> just winter <laughs> Well, I think this is the other thing that the reason why the pamphlet feels a bit slight is that, as you were saying, Rebecca, this was meant to be part of a broader campaign, uh, which was that Protect and Survive was like broadcast first with this pamphlet as your handy reminder guide of all the stuff that you'd just been told. And the short films had all been produced. They were classified as confidential and they were not meant to be broadcast across television at all, unless the government anticipated a nuclear attack was going to happen within 72 hours, but kind of like the way the pamphlet came out, uh, unauthorised recordings leaked out to the BBC. They were actually produced by uh, Richard Taylor Cartoons, who was known for works like Charlie Says and Crystal Tips and Alistair, and they, the films kind of mirrored the content of the booklets, but they are they have that same peculiar tone that's at, at once very serious, but also kind of almost charming you know it's got these little characters who are going about their business and then it cuts to an interior and there they are building their shelter and trying to survive the most terrible thing any human can possibly imagine i think it's the contrast of the domestic setting as well and the very serious international events which must have gone Mm. catastrophically wrong for that chain of sequences (laughs) to have been enacted and the, the, the sentence that made me genuinely just feel sick was If you live in a caravan or other similar accommodation which provides very little protection against fallout, your local authority will be able to advise you on what to do. (laughs) (laughs) Just go lie in that ditch over there, I reckon. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. People were obviously very interested in the contents of Protect and Survive, but it didn't reassure them. We know this because a poll five years later by the government's Central Office of Information found that 80% of British adults were pessimistic about the prospects of surviving a nuclear conflict. The thing is, though, and we know this from COVID, don't we, there is a benefit to not feeling hopeless. There is a benefit to feeling like you personally have agency to protect your family, even if you don't. And it's important for just for civil obedience. It's important for the government to try and support the idea that individuals have agency, even if they actually don't, because that will calm them down and stop protests and riots. I mean, that's really what's going on here, isn't it? It's like, this will be the absolute minimum that someone would have to do to survive, and the vast majority of them would die. But it's probably better than nothing, and it will give them the impression that they've done something. Absolutely, yeah. Taras Young, who was the author of a history titled Nuclear War in the UK, 
Uh, while he was researching his book, he said he found a note by one of the civil servants who was involved in preparing Protect and Survive. And it said something like, we must make people believe that they can survive. Not that they could survive, but they needed to believe that they could. And that kind of <laughs> yeah. sums up this whole thing. And even if you did survive, then what? You, t you survived into hell on earth. It's like, yeah. you know, is there any point in surviving something when you were going to be landing in like post-apocalyptic disaster? No civil defence pamphlet would be issued until 2004's Preparing for Emergencies, which tackles natural disasters, terrorist attacks, even foot and mouth disease, but does not mention nuclear war. The government was obviously like, do you know what? F*** it, guys. You laughed at us. You're on your yeah. own. Enjoy yeah. your nuclear holocaust. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we know what the advice is going to be if there's a nuclear holocaust from now onwards, isn't it? It's going to be stay at home, protect the NHS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Draw rainbows, you guys. That's all we got. <laughs> Tomorrow. This is like our equivalent of JFK's funeral, or Martin Luther King's funeral. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.